Okay, so uh, last time I left you with this little puzzle here, uh, which was how many books, what's the minimum number of books stacked on top of a support? Uh, so this is, you don't count the thing that it's stacked on as, uh, as one of the books. So what's the minimum number of books on top of the support that's needed to have one book completely overhang without, uh, you know, completely overhang the base? Right, so uh, we'll, we'll vote on this and then I'll, I'll tell you the solution to the puzzle. So we don't, we don't count the, the base as, as one of the books, right? So it's the books on top of the base uh, that's needed. We'll stop at 30 seconds. Last few votes. Okay, so uh, nobody, nobody's sure, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the favorite is, is, is C. So I'll, I'll show you the right answer, and then I'll explain how you do it. I'll attempt to show you the right answer. So B is the right answer. You need four books is the minimum number of books. And uh, I'll show you how to do it in a second. All right. <clears throat> so here's how you stack your books. So if this is our, our, uh, our, our table edge or whatever. So this is the one where we, we, want to have, we want to have the top book not overhanging this at all. Right? So we're going to assume that we can balance things perfectly. So these are perfectly uniform books. So our first book goes like that, and it's exactly halfway over the edge. Right? So our next two books go like this. Right? So that's, that, would be, that would be balanced, only uh, what will, or is that the minimum? No. You have to have one more on top of here, I think, to make it balance. And that, I think, is the minimum number, right? So you don't actually stack them in a pile going out like that. You can stack them like this, and you have a, a cantilevered system. I'm not actually sure. You might not need that top one there. Um, pardon? No, 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 this, okay, this book, you have a book lying not over the edge, though, right? It's not the... Okay, so I'm wondering whether you don't need that, then. That, that one, I think, so then, then the answer would be A, actually, is that... So maybe that's it, then, you don't need... Because if these are perfectly balanced, right, this is at the midpoint here, um, and so these two books are perfectly balanced, and they will have, yeah, so this, this, actually, that's right, you only need three, you don't need the one on top, right, so you only need three, so actually the answer is A, so I wonder actually, because I had, I, I always had the no answer noted as four, so I wonder actually if the past, if whether I included the support at the bottom, um, but okay, so this is what you need then, three, three books on top of the support, right, so the answer is A, right, so this is still, this is one of the top books, at least, is not cover, is, is uh, completely uh, uh, suspended over the edge here. The trick is, is that if you want to do it with a smaller number of books, you don't do a sort of a curving stack like this. What you actually do is you add books on this side to counterbalance the weight going over here, and that allows you to lever these things out further than it would otherwise do, right? And so, in fact, there's, there's, a, there's a website where I got this from, which, um, which, which way they have actually two programs. They have one program that can calculate the, uh, uh, the maximum extension. If you give it like you know, 10, 10 books, it'll actually calculate how far out the 
book on the top of the stack is. And then there's another one where you can calculate the most efficient way to stack. Uh, and, uh, and, and in that case, then what happens is you add books on this side to counterbalance the stack going out. So you can calculate the maximum overhang possible with a number of books, yeah, with some mathematician with far too much time on their hands. Um, but you can actually optimize this, right? There is, a, there is a website out there, if you Google it, for stacked books that will uh, calculate the maximum overhang possible. And the trick here is that you've got to add books on the other side, right? It's not just a vertical stack. You want to add books here, and you can get a bigger overhang, right? So I think this is, this is the minimum number. I know you have to put stacked books on the, on the side here to get the overhang. Anyway, but you can search that on Google if you're, uh, if you're still interested. That was just for fun. <clears throat> OK, so uh, last time we got to this problem here uh, at the end of the lecture, which is how, how far does a motorcycle rider have to tilt uh, in order to balance when they're going round uh, a corner? And this was introducing the concept of a center of gravity, which is where the weight acts. And we said that this is different. Remember, it's a different thing from the center of mass. Uh, because the center of mass is the average location of the mass. Center of gravity is where the weight acts. If we have a constant gravitational field, the two are at the same location. But if the gravitational field is not constant over the size of the object, then the center of mass and the center of gravity will not necessarily be in the same location. So and the example was if you had a sort of uniform rod near a black hole where the gravitational field varies over the length of the rod quite significantly, the center of gravity of the rod will be nearer the black hole than the center of mass of the rod. And then in that case, they'll be in two separate locations. But for everyday objects on the surface of the Earth, technically the gravitational field here is slightly different than the gravitational field there. But this difference is, is basically negligible because uh, we're all so far away from the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the rate of change of the gravitational field is not something we, we feel or notice. I mean, if you're flying in a plane, you don't feel that you've lost a lot of weight uh, simply because you're higher up from the, uh, from the Earth. So we take the gravitational field as constant, and therefore the center of gravity and the center of mass are the same. So <clears throat> if we have this system here, what we've got And I'll just draw the forces here. I'm not going to attempt to uh, draw the uh, actual motorbike. Is we have a series of three forces like this, where this angle here is theta, right? And we have a distance r is the distance between the center of gravity and the bottom of the tire of the motorcycle, right? So this is the center of gravity of the uh, uh, motorcycle and rider combined. We have a normal force acting up from the ground, and we have a friction force acting towards the uh, center of rotation. Because remember, we're, go we're going around a corner, so we're rotating about some vertical axis uh, 30 meters, I think was the uh, radius of curvature. So we've got a. a um, So we've got a 30 meter radius of curvature. And so we have a net acceleration, a net centripetal acceleration towards this uh, uh, center of, of rotation because we're going around in a, in a circular path. So if we look at this, we can first of all do Newton's second law. And we can do Newton's second law because it's a two dimensional problem in two directions. So vertically, we have no acceleration. So if we do Newton's second law upwards as positive, then we have R minus mg, because that's the net force acting vertically. Friction has no component. Since there is no acceleration, this has to be equal to 0. And so we can conclude from this that the normal force is just equal to the weight, because we're not accelerating vertically upwards or downwards. Then we can do Newton's second law in the horizontal direction, I'll take this way as positive because that's the direction of our acceleration. And so therefore, we have the friction force here, F, is equal to, and then in this case, we have the mass, and then the acceleration is going to be the speed of the motorcycle squared 
divided by the radius of curvature, right? So this is just the frictional force is equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration because we're going round in a, in a, in a corner, uh, you're going round a corner. So we've got two equations, <coughs> but we've got uh, uh, two unknowns because we're not told, right? All we're told is that we're allowed to assume that the coefficient of friction is enough to stop the bike from skidding. So we're not told that this is the limiting case of friction, so we cannot use F equals mu times R because first of all, we don't know the coefficient of friction, but secondly, we're not even told that it's a limiting case. So the only thing we get from friction is this inequality that says F is less than or equal to mu times R, and that's not useful for solving an equation, that's not useful for solving this problem. We have an inequality rather than an actual uh, uh, equation. So we need to have one extra condition because we don't know R and we don't know uh, F, right? Or well, we do know R, but we don't know uh, uh, F. So what we have to add uh, uh, to the, well, the other thing is we don't know theta, right? So we've got these two equations here, but the one thing we're trying to calculate here, theta, does not occur in either of them. So in fact, actually, I, I'm wrong there. We could solve for R and we can solve for F because we know all the quantities here. We've got two equations and two unknowns, but this doesn't help us because we don't have this quantity theta here. So it's not going to tell us how far the motorcycle rider has to tilt uh, in order to stay in equilibrium. So to calculate that, we have to use our third equilibrium condition. Now, this is perhaps a little bit of a misnomer to call it equilibrium because we do have an acceleration towards the center here. So maybe rather than call it equilibrium condition, the better way to say it is we don't want the rider to have an angular acceleration because if he has an angular acceleration, he's either going to be rotating like that uh, away from the center of rotation or into the center of rotation. And either way, if you're riding a motorcycle, you don't want to have an angular acceleration uh, because that means you're about to flip either inside, you know, flip, flip down and, and skid out or you're about to flip over uh, and skid out. So I, either way, it's bad for the rider. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take moments, and we're going to take moments about the center of mass here, or the, the center of gravity, right? Because if we don't take moments, well, we, we could actually we could take moments about here. Um, but let's take moments about the center of gravity. So um, we're going to take, uh, which way positive? Well, let's take uh, clockwise positive. It doesn't make any difference, right? So if we're taking moments about here, then we've got uh, clockwise as positive, then we've got F, and we want the perpendicular component of F. So that's going to be F opening the angle, so it's F sine theta. times r, and then minus, because this is going to make it rotate in the uh, counterclockwise sense. So if this is theta, this is 90 minus theta, and so therefore this here is theta, and so therefore it's r, we're closing the angle now, so it's r cosine theta times the distance r, right, because we're taking moments about here, is equal to zero, right? So these two moments have to cancel out because we want no angular acceleration, right? If these two moments do not cancel out, we have an angular acceleration and the motorcycle rider is either gonna start flipping one way or the other, right? So if we look at this, the first thing we can see is that the actual distance of the center of gravity from the ground doesn't matter, that cancels out. And what we get is, putting in these values here, is mv squared over r times sine theta is equal to mg cosine theta, right? So mass cancels out and we get tan theta is equal to r times g over v squared. And what have I done wrong? No, nothing. OK. Uh, 
Okay, I just did it slightly differently here. Sorry, I, I, I didn't remember having the R in the, uh, uh, in the end. Okay, so, because this R, yeah, what, what confused me here is this R, of course, I should call it R prime, because this is the radius of curvature. That was what was confusing me. Uh, so the distance, so this distance R from the ground to the center of gravity does not matter. That cancels out here when we take the moments, but this R prime, the radius of curvature does matter uh, because it's the, radi it's the radius of curvature, and that tells us how rapidly we're accelerating as we go around the corner. So apologies for that. that that's why you should never use the same symbol to mean two different things, otherwise it gets confusing. Right, so all we have to do now is stick in our numbers. We know the radius of curvature. We know the uh, acceleration due to gravity. We know the speed of the motorcycle uh, uh, rider, and... So we end up with this quantity here. And so we end up with theta being 46.6 degrees. If we take the inverse tangent of that. Right? So all we used was we used Newton's second law vertically and horizontally. We used the uh, uh, fact that the total moment of the rider has to be equal to zero uh, around the center of mass, and we can then solve to find the angle of tilt that the rider has. Now, the interesting thing with this, and this is why motorcycle riding, uh, you, know, you'll, you will see accidents happen far more with motorcycles than you will with cars when, they go, uh, when they're racing around corners, is that this is an example of an unstable equilibrium. If the motorcycle rider does not lean far enough to provide, uh, to, 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 to make everything here balance, so in other words, if theta is a little bit too large, then what will happen is this, uh, the weight will not provide sufficient moment to keep them stable. It reduces, if you look at it here, as theta gets larger, this angle here uh, uh, gets smaller, and so this, the, the moment of the weight here, that, that's, or the, well, whichever way you look at it, right, if you just keep it around the center of mass, because that's the way we took the moment. So if we keep it around the center of mass here, if this angle gets uh, uh, larger here, the moment of the friction will get larger, right, because the friction will be more perpendicular to this line, and so that will actually increase the net moment making the bike turn that way. So if the bike is up here, then the moment of friction is larger and making it turn more this way. Right? If the bike is lent too far down, then the moment of friction is less and the, um, and the moment of the normal force is larger, and so therefore the bike will want to turn more in this direction. So if you move away from the, uh, from the sort of the balance point, then the bike will want to fall more away from it, right? So it's, it's what we call a, it's not really an equilibrium, but it's an unstable position to be in. And if you get it slightly wrong, then the forces will act to move you further away from the balance point. And so that's why it can be very difficult uh, uh, for, for motorcycle riders going around corners to balance things precisely. If they get things slightly wrong, then you know, they have to make corrections in order to fix it because the forces will naturally make them flip out as they, as they go around a corner. So it's not too hard. You can make adjustments and, and, and correct for it, but it's a lot harder than it is with a car going around the corner where the only thing you have to worry about is is, is the friction enough to, to allow you to go around the corner. A motorcycle rider has it a lot more tricky because they've got to get this angle right, and if they get it wrong, they've got to take corrective action because the forces will, will not keep them uh, uh, balanced. Okay, so any questions about that problem? Okay, good. Okay, so the next thing is, is how do we determine the, uh, the center of gravity of an object? Well, it turns out that it's actually very, very easy to do. All you have to do is take your object. Now, of course, this is a nice uh, regular object, so it's easy to see. But if you take it and you hold it from one point and allow it to suspend freely, then you know the center of gravity has to act, uh, has to be somewhere vertically below the pivot which is supporting it. Because if the center of gravity was off to one side here like this, 
then all you have to do is calculate the uh, net moment about this uh, point of attachment here, and you'll see that the center of the weight then has a net moment about this point of attachment, and so there will be an angular acceleration of the object, right? So in this case, the object will start to swing around like this. It will gain an angular acceleration. And the only way you can make that disappear is if the center of gravity lies directly under the point of attachment, because then the moment of the weight about this pivot is going to be zero, because it acts, its line of action goes straight through the pivot, so its lever arm is zero, right? The, the component, the perpendicular component multi of the weight is zero uh, uh, when you take the distance between the pivot and where the weight acts, which is the center of gravity. So if you su suspend the a piece of paper or any object from a point, the center of gravity must lie directly below that point. Now, of course, that just tells you a line on which the center of gravity is, but then if you suspend the piece of paper from a different point or whatever your object is from a different point, that will give you a second line, and where those two lines cross will tell you precisely where the center of gravity is, because in both cases, the center of gravity must lie along each line, those two lines will intersect, have to intersect at a point, and so that point is where the center of gravity is, is going to be, right? So that's an easy way to measure the location of the center of gravity, right? You just suspend an object from two points. Even if it's a three-dimensional object, you will end up with two lines. Of course, it might be harder to see where they intersect because they may well intersect in the middle of the, uh, the object somewhere. Um, <coughs> Uh, but at least with a two-dimensional object, it's, it's relatively easy to see that uh, the center of gravity will, will be where those two lines intersect. And this works for any shaped object, right? It doesn't, I just had a regular shape here, but if, uh, if I had something funny like this, uh, it would still work perfectly for that, right? It's where the two lines intersect tells you where the center of gravity is. Okay, so <coughs> having talked about uh, 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 equilibrium and, and moving on to center of gravity, the, uh, the last little bit of this uh, uh, section of the course is to actually talk about gravity itself. So gravity is, I would say, the, the most mysterious fundamental force in nature. We know there are four fundamental forces. Two of them are nuclear forces, the strong nuclear force that holds the nucleus together, the weak nuclear force that is responsible for, for beta decay. So those are the two nuclear forces. And then we have the electromagnetic force, uh, uh, you know, the charge, the, 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 that is attractional repulsion between electric charges. But gravity is the, uh, is, the, is, the, is the fourth fundamental force, and it's mysterious in that it is many, many orders of magnitude smaller than any of the other forces of nature, right? Uh, to put this in, in, in context, uh, usually the, the, we quote it as about 36 orders of magnitude smaller than the electromagnetic force, uh, and you can do this if you look at a, a hydrogen atom, which is about 10 to the minus uh, uh, 9, 10 to the minus 10 meters in size, and you look at the Coulomb force between an, the electron and the proton compared to the gravitational force between the electron and the proton, and you'll get the fact that the uh, electromagnetic force is 36 orders of magnitude roughly uh, um, bigger than the gravitational force. And so this is why in particle physics, uh, we have a very good understanding of the weak force and the electromagnetic force, and, and to some extent the strong force, we have no idea about gravity because it is so much weaker than all the other forces that, that any effects of gravity are just completely lost, right? We, we only way we see things interact in, uh, in colliders or on very, very tiny scales is, is by a, uh, one of the other three forces, and we don't see interactions of gravity at very, very tiny scales because, we, uh, uh, because the gravitational effect is so incredibly weak. Um, <coughs> plus, uh, we can't actually reconcile gravity with quantum physics. This is sort of one of the, the uh, huge missing pieces in, in physics. So, you know, you guys, if you become physicists, this is something maybe you, you get to work on um, and, and solve it for us because we need someone to fix it. Um, we have this problem where if you come up with a quantum theory of gravity, uh, you can't make it work. 
You can actually construct a quantum theory of gravity, but you have to put an energy cutoff on it. And so you say it can't work above some energy. And since there's no physical reason to put a cutoff on the energy scale of gravity, um, you know, we, 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 you know, it doesn't work, right? You can't just start putting arbitrary energy cutoffs in your theory when there's no physical reason for you to put an energy cutoff at any particular value. Um, and since the physics changes depending on where you put your cutoff, uh, you know, this is not a good theory, right? It tells us that we're missing something, it's broken. Um, and the best candidate uh, we've got so far for si fixing this is something called string theory, uh, which some theorists absolutely hate and refer to it as not even a theory. Uh, and and the, reason they, the, the reason they hate it so much is because it's, it deals with physics at the very, very high energy scales. And the, and the way it explains the weakness of gravity is it says, well, perhaps there's extra dimensions of space. And, uh, uh, and so instead of, instead of having particles, we actually have strings, but the strings are bent into these sort of compact dimensions of space. Uh, so the best way to think about this is to think of it, if you had a one-dimensional universe, which was a human hair, right? If you look at it uh, with your eyes, it looks sort of pretty fine and, and one-dimensional. If you look under it with a microscope, you can actually see that there's a second dimension that's curled up, right? You're actually dealing with a cylinder, not a one-dimensional line. And so the, the theory is, is that, you know, when we look at space on, on large scales, um, which actually surprisingly not that small, you know, a, a micrometer uh, is, is about the limit, or maybe slightly less than a micrometer. No, it must be less than a micrometer. So uh, about a, a, a so somewhat less than a micrometer. Um, what we have is that space has more than three dimensions, right? So we have a, a fourth dimension, or, or you know, many more. In fact, string theory tends to prefer about eleven dimensions, um, and these are all curled up in some way, and gravity gets to go into these extra dimensions, and so we only see gravity as it passes through our three-dimensional uh, 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 universe, and, uh, and, and so that's why gravity is so weak, because it's spending most of its time circulating through these invisible extra dimensions. And so we may actually see evidence for this at the LHC, um, although it's, it's, it's probably very unlikely. So anyway, that, that's one of the reasons why gravity is so mysterious. However, <coughs> um, what we do have, uh, you know, so Einstein, well, we'll deal with relativity later, and Einstein did improve on this, but Newton, as well as coming up with the laws of mechanics, he also came up with the law of gravity, and uh, this was uh, the apocryphal story is, of course, when he, an apple fell on his head, and he suddenly figured out gravity from that. So. Uh, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Um, so uh, his, his uh, law of gravity says that we have, that there is an attractive force between masses, and it's inversely proportional to the distance squared and directly proportional to the magnitude of the two masses. And it is always attractive. So it's not like an electric force which can depend on the sign of the charges, so far out in the universe, we've never seen anything with a negative mass. Well, actually, that's not, well, yeah, we haven't seen anything with a negative mass. We have seen something that's gravitationally repulsive, uh, but Newton's law of gravity can't explain that. You have to go to general relativity to explain how something can be repulsive under gravity. And even then, we still have no clue what the heck it is. We call it dark energy, and the theorists come up with, with fanciful ideas uh, with, with no basis in, in any sort of uh, data uh, or in any, in any sort of fact. So they're not, it's, it's, that's another one of the big mysteries, right? Is what is 73% of the universe is this dark energy. We haven't even got a good theory as to what this stuff is. Um, but Newton's law of gravity ha happily ignores this um, and just says that we have a force of attraction between two masses that's inversely proportional to the distance squared and directly proportional to the magnitude of the masses. And G here is something that's one of the fundamental constants of the universe. It's nothing we can derive. You have to go out and do experiments and measure it. And it's really hard to measure because gravity is so weak, right? It's a very, very difficult thing to measure. And 
so we only actually have it accurate to about four decimal places, right? So if you remember, if you look in the back of your book and look at the sort of the constant for the electric charge or the epsilon naught for the permittivity of free space, which is sort of the electric field's equivalent of G here, you'll see it measured to about eight, nine, ten decimal places or more. Um, gravity here, we have it measured to four decimal places, right? And that's because gravity is so incredibly weak. And if you look at the co uh, constants here, we've got to end up with something in newtons. These are kilograms. That's distance squared. And so the units of this are newtons meter squared per kilogram squared, right? But you can see from the value of this thing, 10 to the minus uh, uh, 11, it's a very, very small value. And that also contributes to gravity being incredibly weak, right? That's, that's why gravity is so weak, because the value of this constant is, uh, uh, is so low. Now, you'll notice here that I haven't put vector symbols. This is because this equation here calculates the magnitude of the force. The direction of the force is along a line between the two masses, pulling them together. It's always an attractive force. Newtonian gravity has no repulsive force at all, right? And it only has forces on masses. No mass, no force, and always attractive between two masses. Right, so it's nice and simple. Now, <clears throat> that's great, but supposing, for example, we're on a planet, and we want to know what is the force of gravity on any particular mass that happens to be hanging around. Now, it's not particularly useful to sort of start remembering the dimensions of the radius of the planet, its mass, uh, in fact, you, you have to be a little bit more complicated because you've got you know, variations in the constituent of the planet and stuff like this. So you don't really want to have to know all of these quantities and then multiply it by the mass of your object. You want to keep things nice and simple, have a simple, single number that you can quote to tell you the strength of gravity for any particular mass that you happen to have to hand. So if you look at this, if, we, if we're sitting on a planet here, then we have all, one of these masses here, say, for example, m1, is always going to be the mass of the planet. And r here will always be the distance away we are from the, uh, the center of the planet. And so we can actually simplify this by just quoting the force per unit mass. Right? So rather than quote the total gravitational force, you know, and, and then we have a different number we've got to calculate for each object, it saves a little bit of time <coughs> if we can quote the force per unit mass. And so we can condense this uh, equation. We just divide it through. We just take out the m2. And we end up with the force per unit mass is our gravitational field times our, our mass that's generating the gravitational field and divided by the distance we are away from it squared. And so this we call little g and it's our gravitational field. Now, if you think about it, force per unit mass, well, if you go back to Newton's second law, we have force is equal to mass times acceleration. So if you have a force per unit mass, this thing is going to have units of meters per second squared. So we can call this the gravitational field strength, but since it's also got dimensions of acceleration, the other thing it's commonly called is the acceleration due to gravity. And this is how we calculate g for, for example, all the, all the problems we've done so far, where we've assumed a constant gravitational field. What you can do is you can assume the Earth is roughly uniform, um, stick in the mass of the Earth and the uh, radius, and you'll get a quantity for the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth. In fact, you know, we can do this here. So, if we know the Earth's radius is 6,367 uh, uh, kilometers, and that's something you can measure by uh, measuring the angle of the sun at two simultaneous points on the Earth's surface and knowing how far apart those two points are. And this is something the ancient Greeks managed to do 2,000 years ago. So it's not exactly you know, high-tech modern uh, uh, equipment needed. All you need is something capable of measuring an angle and have two people measure that angle at the same time. Um, <coughs> you can calculate the radius of the Earth, and the Greeks did a pretty good job of that. Um, now, of course, the bit they couldn't do because they didn't have Newton around at that time uh, is, is to relate this to the, the acceleration due to gravity. 
So we have a measured acceleration due to gravity of 9.81 meters per second squared. It varies over the surface of the Earth. It's less near mountain ranges uh, and larger near oceans, which seems a little bit counterintuitive until you realize that mountain ranges rise up because they're a lot less dense than the normal material of the Earth's surface, and they have a huge root system, as it were, underneath them, which, which uh, gives them buoyancy on top of the mantle. And so therefore, actually, when you're near mountains, uh, you're, you're near a lot of less dense rocks. And when you're away from mountains, um, the, the rocks have a larger density, and so therefore you get a bigger gravitational field. And uh, this was actually discovered by accident by the uh, British Survey of India, where they, they did a, a survey from the Himalayas all the way down to the southern tip of India using triangulation, and at the same time also using a, a, a theodolite to measure the angles of the sun at given times. And when they compared these two measurements, they found they were out by a few centimeters, uh, which you think, well, wow, it's only a few centimeters over several thousand kilometers, not a big deal. Uh, but the accuracy of the measurements was such that that should not have happened. And they eventually attributed that to the fact that the uh, plumb line that they were using to measure the angles, vert the vertical angles to the sun, the plumb line, when it was near the Himalayas, was tilted slightly away from the Himalayas uh, instead of being uh, vertical. And so uh, they actually measured that effect and, and, and managed to explain it. And, and that helped the uh, geologists uh, and geophysicists uh, learn about the structure of the Earth. That was a little aside. So anyway, uh, getting back to this, we can calculate the gravitational field strength here. We know this gravitational field constant. Uh, we know the radius of the Earth, because uh, we can measure it this way. We know the gravitational field strength. And so if we stick these, uh, stick these numbers in here into our equation for the gravitational field strength, we can calculate the mass of the Earth as just under 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms, right, which is a little bit off. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're about one, one part in a you know, we're, we're 5.96 is what we get, and 5.97 is the actual measured value. So it's not perfect, but you can make a pretty good approximation to the uh, mass of the Earth by assuming a constant gravitational field and a radius of the Earth, right? So <coughs> measuring stick uh, uh, and, uh, and, and a little bit of knowledge of physics, and you can uh, calculate the mass of the planet. Okay, so supposing we have a planet called Trantor that's got twice the mass and twice the radius of Earth. What is the gravitational field strength on the surface of this planet compared to the Earth's gravitational field? D. Excellent. Okay. No problems there. So that is indeed the right answer. You guys have done this before at high school? Who, who's done gravitational fields before at high school? Who has not done gravitational fields before? Nobody. OK. So uh, OK, we should go a little bit faster then. Um, <coughs> so apologies if you've heard this before. D is indeed the right answer. What's happening is you've got G is equal to uh, GM over R squared. So if this doubles, <coughs> so this goes to G, and then the mass doubles, so that's 2M. The radius doubles, so that's 2R squared. So you end up with 4 on the bottom, 2 on the top. And so that is equal to uh, GM over 2R squared. So it's half the original value. OK, so <coughs> just a reminder, we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier in the course, but mass versus weight, mass, remember, is an inherent property of an object, does not vary no matter where the object is. Uh, it's how much it resists being moved and how strongly it feels a gravitational force. We talked about gravitational mass versus inertial mass. Every measurement says that these two things are exactly the same, but at a fundamental level, we don't understand why they're exactly the same. Um, but what we do have is this relationship between mass uh, and weight, so that the larger the mass, the larger the weight, but that's not a universal relationship, right? There is one relationship here on the planet Earth. There's another one if you go to Mars or go to the moon, 
Um, and the, the relationship here on the Earth is determined by the fact that we have a roughly constant gravitational field. And in fact, this is a big problem if you happen to be an astronaut, because uh, when they're on the moon, it was, they had to have special training to make sure they didn't injure themselves, because we have an innate sort of uh, uh, evolutionary, or, or learned at least, experience of the relationship between weight and inertial mass, so that you know if something's heavy and you pick it up, it's got a large inertial mass, and you have to be careful with it. Well, the problem is, is on the moon, of course, the gravitational field is six times less than the Earth, so you can pick up something which weighs, uh, which, which, which is six times heavier than what you could pick up on the Earth, but what that means is it's got six times the inertial mass. So you could pick up, you know, a hundred kilogram mass without much trouble at all on the moon, um, and you might be tempted, in fact, because you found it so easy to pick up, you might be tempted to throw that at your fellow astronaut, expecting them to catch it, uh, whereas then, of course, it will acquire a, a, a certain velocity uh, and will smash into them and knock them onto the ground. Uh, so, you know, even though it's quite easy for you to pick it up and, and throw it, uh, that's a very bad thing to do because the inertial mass is the same and you'll end up uh, killing your crewmate, um, which is regarded as a bad thing. Um, so, <clears throat> you have to be a little bit careful. So, measured weight, right? We talked about this before, but now we've got the Earth's gravitational field there. So, a person stands on the same bathroom scales in Edmonton and then travels to Calgary and does the same. If we assume that their mass has remained constant, so they didn't stop at Burger King on the way down there, um, and they're at the same height above sea level, right? So, no difference in height uh, uh, versus the center of the Earth. Uh, and that, uh, so, both locations are exactly the same height, and the scales are extremely accurate, right? So, very, very accurate scales. Does the scale read precisely the same value in Edmonton and Calgary? So, your options here are no, higher in Calgary, yes, it's the same in locations, no, lower in Calgary, or I haven't told you enough to, to determine. Oh, we're also assuming the Earth's a perfect, so we're assuming a, a perfectly spherical Earth. Oh. Okay, so we seem to have a winner. Okay, well, we're running a little bit out of time, so I don't think we've got time for the, for the discussion stage, but I, I'll, I'll explain the answer. So, <clears throat> the answer is... C. It will read lower in Calgary than it will in Edmonton, if you have a scale that's accurate enough. Here's why. We are not on a stationary planet. The planet is rotating, right? So the gravitational field of both locations will be exactly the same, and your weight in both locations will be exactly the same. But you are not, the bathroom scales does not measure the weight. It, remember, it measures the normal force between you and the, uh, uh, and the ground. And if you look at the planet, in Edmonton, we are going round in a circle like this, and Calgary uh, is not really in the tropics, but I'll, I'll draw it a little bit further down. Certainly not today, anyway. Um, and so if you look at the paths that somebody's taking, you're taking a circular path as you orbit uh, well, not orbit, but as you, as you rotate around the axis of rotation of the Earth. But here in Edmonton, our radius is smaller, and in Calgary, the radius is larger. Oops, I got that wrong, didn't I? Sorry, the answer is A. Ah. Brain is not working today. <coughs> right, so he here's why. Here we have R, well, I call it RE and RC. This is the problem with cold medications. Um, RE is less than the radius at Calgary, right? So the radius at Edmonton is less than the radius at Calgary. And if you're going around in a circle, you have an acceleration that's V squared over R. Now, 
Uh, I'm really not having a good day today, am I? Um, it, I did get it right. It's better to think of it as r omega squared. We have the same angular velocity. Sorry, my, I, I, I'm not having a good day today. Uh, we have the, the Earth is rotating with a constant angular velocity, omega. And so we have a, a constant, uh, so we have the same angular velocity. It doesn't matter whether we're in Edmonton or we're in Calgary. But the centripetal acceleration is r times omega squared. So if you're moving with the same angular velocity, the larger the radius that you're following, the larger the centripetal acceleration, and some component of your weight is providing that centripetal acceleration. And so that component of the weight that's providing the centripetal acceleration and keeping you held to the surface of the planet, despite the fact that it's rotating round, is not being counteracted by the normal force, right? So on your body, what you have is you have your weight acting down, you have a normal force acting up, but you have a net acceleration, a centripetal acceleration, that is keeping you going round uh, uh, with the surface of the Earth. And it's that centripetal acceleration that means that the normal force is slightly less than your weight. And so if you have a bigger centripetal acceleration, there is a bigger difference between the two. And so therefore, your measured weight, which is this normal force here, will be less in Calgary because the centripetal acceleration is larger. It's a tiny, tiny effect, and you don't feel it. But if you had scales that were accurate enough and had uniform masses, it would, in theory, be possible to measure it. OK, so I'll stop there, and we'll carry on. And uh, hopefully, I'll be feeling better on Wednesday. <laughs>